Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, brothers and sisters, welcome to Faith Inspired. Uh, we have again a wonderful guest with us to find out more about them and how they're inspired by their faith to contribute to the things that they are contributing to. Uh, let's find out a bit more. Uh, today we have with us is uh, Harun Rashid Khan, the Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain, MCV. Harun Bhai, Assalamu alaikum. Welcome, salam. welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Uh, sorry that we've taken you out of your busy schedule to come and spend some time with our uh, launching program, if you like, Faith Inspired. Uh, I, you must be very busy at MCV. Yeah, it's busy. I think uh, being the biggest, largest sort of umbrella organization for Muslim organizations and charities in the UK, it has its demands. Uh, but Alhamdulillah, we, we're meeting some of those demands as much as we can. Um, but we face a lot of challenges, which I'm sure you'll ask me about yes. some of the things uh, a bit later on. But um, on the whole, I feel quite inspired and positive with, with the challenges, but also inspired as well, and mainly f coming from my faith. Sure. Now, I mean, if, if we were to find out a bit more about what you're doing at MCB, we know that the, uh, you, in my eyes, seem to be like the second generation uh, of, of people who are now uh, taking a lead uh, in trying to make a difference to the wider community and also specifically the Muslim community at large. How, how easy is that? It's, uh, so I'm coming, I'm now into my second year of the first term uh, as Secretary General. There's an election coming this summer. Okay. Uh, there is a potential second term if I get elected mm -hmm. again. Um, and it's an open election, all the members come in and vote. Um, how's it been? It's, it's, I think where I see myself I am second generation, mainly because I was born in the UK. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my peers around my age group, a lot of them weren't necessarily born in the UK as such. Uh, so even if they come at an early age, you could sort of classify them as second generation, uh, not from our parents' generation. And I, when I got elected, it became a big news story, I think, for a big Muslim organization to have someone at the top from second generation seems to have become quite a good news story. Um, it was well, well covered. Um, and, and I would hope that just by the virtue of me being there, inspired other people that, you know, we can actually take the helm of organizations, Muslim organizations, because we hear a lot of complaints from other sectors um, within the Muslim community specifically, that it's, you know, young people or next generation people are not able to step in uh, and, and, and take a lead. Um, I do it in a respectful way because I learn everything from my elders mm -hmm. and the older generation. And I also rely on a, on a lot of them for advice. So a lot of them are involved. A lot of the, the MCB former secretary generals, former leaders are acting as advisors as well because they have a lot to share. Mm. Um, you know, I'm not somebody who's come with a huge amount of expertise and like I know everything. I don't. Um, there's a lot to learn and I think I'm almost I feel as though I'm almost the bridge between the baby boomers and the millennials <laughs> well I mean, one, one interesting thing we pointed out there is is the whole idea of experience now experience is not something that you could just buy I mean mm. skills are something that uh, anybody can gain over a period of time but experience really is so rich there is so much more than just specific uh, tick box exercises we're talking uh, a sense of going through something going through a journey <coughs> learning from uh, difficulties sometimes celebrating uh, you know if you like uh, success but uh, how important do you find that experience is a very important aspect when it comes to contributing to a community as diverse as the one that uh, you are leading experience is vital um, you need to have some kind of experience whether that's through your work or whether that's through your life experience uh, there's no particular qualification. I'm not a PhD. I don't have a title. I don't have a doctor. You know, so sometimes we find people with titles become leaders, but they may not necessarily have the experience for the job, as in the community-led job. Uh, I, you know, this is from my uh, experience. So experience is really important because you learn a lot, and I'm still learning. Sure. For me, it was a big challenge. I think taking on such a big role over the last 18 months, I've learned quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, meeting people, meeting different organizations, meeting, meeting politicians, 
meeting international leaders, going to in international conferences. It's, it's quite an experience for me. So I think I'm, I've always been on a track where whatever I do, I look at it, I look at it as a developing development role. Uh, not just to be there and, and be the leader, but also constant develop, development for myself, which is really emanating from, from a young age uh, where I was involved in local youth work, whether it was me doing volunteering at the mosque or working in, in work, you know, running youth um, programs, or whether that be working as a school governor, which I did for about 10 years earlier as well. And even then I was quite young but it was, it was a huge experience for me personally in terms of my personal development. So how, how important do you feel now uh, <coughs> that primary and that secondary stage of life and education and whatever you experienced at that time, uh, how, how significant do you think it was for you back then uh, being able to look, uh, look back now uh, from where you are? Um, it's, it's really beneficial, um, I feel. So when I speak to sometimes younger people who are now involved <coughs> in MCB or in organizations, I find that sometimes they refer back to me as well to ask and seek guidance. So I feel as though, okay, I'm not that old <laughs> that I can share it, but there, there's a lot of learning. There's a lot of things I think people don't know, uh, whether it's about interacting with different people. You know, we work in community organizations. There are a lot of dynamics around how you work with people, how you relate to them, how you communicate with them. We, there's a lot we can learn. Um, you know, th these things, I think textbooks can't teach you these things. They can only guide you in a certain way. And other things that you can't learn are values and behaviors. For me, values and behaviors are, are hugely important. You know, you can learn all the leadership skills and tactics on how to do things, but having values and behaviors are very, very important. So your parents must be a very big factor in all of this. Uh, you know, what do you remember as something being so vital from your parents, both your mother and your father, uh, have, you know, now being able to look back? You know, uh, I, I, I assume your parents are with you. Or, or only mother. Only or your well mother's still mother alive. Is still with Allah me. bless her and give yeah, her a long Allah. life. And Allah forgive your father and give Allah. him the highest of paradise. Allah. Yeah, so if you look at your father, late father, and your mother who's still with you, what, what is it that you think was vital for you from those days, even up to now? I think when I was growing up and probably up until my late 20s, up to the 30s, I didn't really think about what influence they had on me. It's only now, I think within the last few years, and that I've reflected on, on this quite a lot. Even when I became the Secretary General of MCB, I paid tribute to my late father. Um, and I'll explain why. And only as you get to this age, you start to realize, and you know, as you know, you would know as well, when you lose someone in your family, like when my father died, it, it, it's only then you realize how important they were in your life, wow. which is quite sad, mm. because they're not there anymore for you to benefit. But you, you then realize, and, and it's from the most mundane things of such as household duties, mm. <laughs> yeah, and build. We just took it. We just take it for granted. Wow, you know, you don't realize. Even though I had moved out of home, even then, the fact that you had someone there, who's your parent, who was taking care of these things for you, you had someone to turn to. You don't have that person anymore. You know, it's a huge gap in your life. You have to fend for yourself. Mm. So that that was the 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 sort of reality dawning. Um, in terms of how did it shape me to become who I am. Uh, I didn't make any grand plans to become the leader of MCB mm -hmm. or to become the leader. Yes, I've got a career, which you can talk about afterwards, but I, you know, I've got a job and I do my career, which is fine, and, and there's, a, there's a track I can follow. But working for the community, there's no big grand plan. I can't say I want to be at the top of this organization and this is where I want to, that's not, that's not the objective. The objective for me has always been how to improve the lives of Muslims and wider society in the UK, because we face many challenges over the decades. And the lesson from my father's time, the, you know, these are very well known within the lo local community from where I grew up. So I grew up next to East London Mosque mm -hmm. uh, from, from birth. Right. I was born in Royal London Hospital. Mm. That was my area, just behind East London Mosque, in one of the houses there. My mother is still living in the same house. SubhanAllah. You know, she's 70 plus now. Wow. And our house became a local hub 
stroke community center mm -hmm. because my father what he used to do because he had uh, an intermediate level of education from Bangladesh he came in the 50s mm -hmm. and he could read and write English so that was a huge benefit to the people that arrived right so so everybody who came <laughs> would come to him any any new visitors any any especially um, in in the 70s mostly single men would come first that's right to come for work mm. and what we see today uh, around the way a lot of uh, immigrants from Europe Eastern European the way they come and work and the way they live together is exactly what our parents did mm. they before he my mother came to the UK um, my father used to do the same thing he used to work um, in a hotel and then they would do shifts where they would they would rent a room and there would be about 12 of them mm. and they would take turns to sleep Wow! so they'd work an eight-hour shift then they come back and they'd cook and then the rest would come back and eat and then sleep That's and wow. they would do it in rotation um, but I've been fortunate Alhamdulillah, you know through the 70s my dad established himself he got our own house mm. and we were reasonably okay mm. um, I wouldn't say we're well off as such but we had our own house brilliant we're gonna come back <coughs> to that uh, uh, in the next segment inshallah to find out a bit more from Harun Rashid Khan the C, uh, the uh, Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain. So we'll be right back. <music> Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Welcome back to Faith Inspired. We are speaking to the Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain, Brother Harun Rashid Khan. We were exploring, uh, you know, his role uh, with the MCB, and then we had the chance to find out a bit more about his life, uh, particularly with his mother, and especially with his father, and the effort that his father was making, uh, and that had a massive impact on, 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 on Brother Harun's life. So you were talking about your dad and the, and the contribution that he was making to a lot of people who were coming at that time from a place like Bangladesh. He did that, so the, the people would just turn up at our door and um, ask for help you know, fill out um, housing application form, immigration application form, and through that process, you know, he would guide them, he would help them fill out their forms, help them find a solicitor, a barrister. So, he, you know, he, constantly there were people coming. My mother's role in all of this uh, was food. <laughs> she was constantly, you know, our house became famous that, you know, if you turned up, there would always be food. Whoever wow. turned up would get, if they're, if they're there at a the meal time, they will get food. So my mom was in the very much in the habit. I mean, this is a massive quality uh, of human beings, and more so yeah, those hospitality. Who are, yeah, the whole idea of yeah. generosity is a massive uh, thing in Islam. So we experienced that, and then also what we did was the other thing my father did was um, he provided accommodation for people as well. Mm. So our house became quite big, where there were rooms upstairs, single rooms that he would let out mm. to people who didn't have a place to go. So they would stay sometimes for a few months sometimes for a couple of years until they got their so own house like a life transition uh, it was a, it was base. like a, it was like a not a homeless service but mm. i think you know temporary accommodation yeah um, until they found a place to go so there could be people who are maybe i don't know five times ten times more more richer if you like than than maybe your, there your are lots late of father yeah. but who, uh, who started off in a, in a there place are, like that there's actually quite a lot of people that you know and i know i won't name them here okay. who have passed through our, my house oh, I and i was young obviously i i met them saw them um at that time and that was mostly in the 70s and mostly through the 80s right up until the late 80s um, people stayed with us. So I had lots of uncles and aunts over so that So did your parents push you to, for example, continue with your pursuit to uh, educate yourself? So, you, uh, you know, uh, for example, university. Yeah. Uh, did you, you know, like, there is this thing about, oh, my mom and dad want me to go to university, so I'm going to go. Uh, how was it for you? It was different. I mean, I, I, I think I was the only son. Uh, I was the youngest with three older sisters at the time. And I went through uh, a process where I went to a different school in Taha Hamlets compared to everybody else. Oh, really? Different in the sense that I didn't go to the usual, the same school that everybody would normally go to. My school was predominantly English. Yeah. So I went to a Church of England school, sure. Rains Foundation, sure. which at the time, in the entire school year, there were four Asian wow. pupils. Wow. I didn't suffer, a, <coughs> I didn't suffer a lot of racism in the school. Right. Um, it was a good school, very disciplined. Mm. So I had a, a reasonable experience in the school. Um, and well, uh, whereas a lot of my peers were in Stepney Green, in John Cass, they were facing all kinds of challenges. Hmm. 
um, I didn't face, not within the school environment, I didn't face those challenges as much. Mm. What about college mm. then? Did you end so, up co so college, I, moved, I went to college, funny enough, so I ha always had an interest in doing practical things. Okay. So, you know, working my hands, yeah. whether you call it DIY or whatever it is, yeah. I always wanted to do something different. I wasn't an academic kind of mm. person. Academic in that sense, the, you know, sort of lot of deep study and research, it wasn't my thing. My, my intention in, inside me was always to be out and doing things. Mm. So I had that side. So I ended up going to college in, in West London. So I used to commute wow. from Whitechapel that's, that's a trip. for two years all the way to Shepherd's Bush. Sure. And I did, um, I actually studied, I was aiming at the time, thinking it was the right thing for me was to go into architecture. Okay. <clears throat> then I realized architecture wasn't my field mm -hmm. and I switched to engineering sure. um, because I found that was more in line with what I was thinking for. And then I did two years at college in um, Shepherd's Bush. Then I came back and then the summer break, I hadn't really thought about university. What am I going to do? Uh, a job advert came up mm. back then. This is going back to what, 1989. Okay. That's a long time ago. <laughs> I won't tell you how my old sister, I was. <laughs> my, sister, my sister, you know, she gave me, showed me a job vacancy at the local council sure. in Tower Hamlets and they had a job for a trainee engineer. So I applied for the job. Um, and then I forgot, I wasn't actively looking. I was doing a summer job in, in Docklands before Canary Wharf was even built. Mm. And uh, it was a temporary job. And then the interview came about four months later and then I did the interview and I got the job. First interview, first full-time mm. job, first interview, I got the job. Mm. And then what I did was while I was working in, in Tower Hamlets as a highway trainee engineer, I studied part-time at University of East London. So I did one day, I didn't have the experience of a full-time university education. It was for me, it was like doing the job and doing the study. So I did civil engineering uh, part time over a long period of time. Um, and then I carried on. So I did, um, I think, about 11 years at Tower Hamlets. And then I went to Transport for London, mm. where I am now. So I've got, in terms of work history, when I say to people, I've got like 28 years mm. of working life. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long time. Alongside that, I also did um, a lot of local community activi um, right. activity. Right. So being close to Islam Mosque, mm. I attended from a youngish, well, initially just Arabic classes with in the mosque, right, okay. the original mosque, the single story mm. water cabin building. Sure. And I've seen the mosque grow to what it is today, obviously mm. being very closely mm. involved. I think the one thing I should mention about my father, the other thing he did, even though he was helping people, he was also an activist. Mm. So he was very strong in actively uh, protesting against the National Front. Okay. So when um, there's a there's a black and white photo of my father in Altabali Park after Altabali got murdered, right. when they went to the first protest. Sure. Um, so he was very active. Mm. He was quite political. Okay. In that sense. Okay. He was politically aware. He followed politics quite a lot. Mm. I didn't at that age, obviously, mm. uh, but he had real interest in politics. Mm. Um, and then obviously over time, so maybe I was saying, so, so the community, his community, love for the community and working, helping people and the political awareness, I think both of those, some elements of those have rubbed off on me without me realizing. Sure. Because I didn't, it, that awareness wasn't really there until now. Now that I reflect on it, mm. I feel as though some of those things have come from him. Uh, you know, in, in, in my sort of, uh, in my life. So really. the current, is, I mean, so your dad, it has been very important from the beginning and even the current role that you're playing it seems clearly that there's been uh, a massive link that which you probably didn't didn't foresee happening but yeah. it's, it's actually happened now within that journey of uh, school college even work life uh, did you find any challenges when it came to uh, uh, your conscious uh, decision to express your faith so in, <clears throat> in terms of my faith I mean my upbringing at home in those days was Basically, you go to the mosque to pray, that's to, to learn Quran, um, you learn how to pray, and then you pray. My, my father never really imposed anything. We, I wouldn't say we were um, overtly religious mm -hmm. or very strong. We had sort of traditional conservative values, mm. um, but beyond sort of prayer, fasting, and, and doing what you need to do, uh, beyond that, we weren't, I wouldn't say classify as whatever the definition is of, you know, really strict. Um, I think my influence in terms of my salah and prayer is more with the people that I stayed with. Okay. And I went for the experience. So I, you know, I started praying regularly, praying fasting. And I think 
mostly through attending different talks and lectures over that period of time, mm -hmm. it inbuilt in me a very strong bond with uh, my religion. Mm -hmm. You know, I wouldn't say that any particular individual, there isn't one person or one scholar I would hold up and say this person has heavily influenced me, because mm. um, I've been quite open-minded in that sense. Um, but I've taken a very deep understanding uh, of, of what my faith means to me and my life. Mm. So throughout my work, for example, um, I've been very strict in certain areas where there's certain things that I don't do. So you're, 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 you're working with the, uh, uh, if you like, the regional government, uh, yep. particularly of London, if you like, the mayor's office. Now, that, I mean, London's one of the most diverse parts of the world, mm. and it's the, the most diverse city perhaps in the world, and of course in the country. Now within that, obviously, uh, you have people of faith and non-faith that you work and you engage with. Uh, you know, how, how has that been for you? It's been fine. I mean, I've been, like I said, I went to a school. I think my school experience was very different. Yeah. Um, my college experience was quite different as well. University was different. They were all different experiences. And I think in, in my workplace, what I found was most of my colleagues, most of them were non-Muslim. So I did my work, but I didn't need to, I think I let my behavior and my values express themselves. Right. I didn't have to lecture anybody I didn't have to say them. I would, I would tell them about my religion when they asked me, mm. why, why do you do this? Why do you do that? What's the purpose of this? Mm. Otherwise, it was trying to live it and so, so that they exactly. could see something from yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I wasn't doing it for show. I mm. was doing it for my own self. That's right. But they had to understand from me that this is my religion. Mm. So even, in my, you know, even from, through my career at uh, my current job, you know, 17, 18 years, you know, I proudly say, and they know it, and, I, and I'm in senior management now, that I don't go to the pub. Right. So, you know, it's a principle. Mm. For me, it's a principle. I don't drink, I don't feel comfortable in pubs, it's not the right place for me. So uh, all the parties that take place and all the, all the different sort of socialising, I don't do. I'll go out for a meal with people, for lunch and dinner, whatever, but the, the, the culture of going out for a drink on a Friday, it's not something that I do, mm. and they know that. So. I think, you know, even through that, whether it's through fasting, whether it's through doing Eid and so on, and, and, and the awareness is growing. Obviously, I'm in the public sector, so it's a bit different. Mm -hmm. There's a bit more openness and a bit more understanding. But even then, we feel, you know, there are still challenges. Thank you very much. I just want to, very, on a final note, if, if those who are watching Faith Inspired, if they were to take a, a word from you or maybe a final uh, few words from you, what would that be based on the experience that you've had so far with your life? inspired by your faith uh, people are watching this and they want to take that inspiration what is it for you to them i think the most important thing for me is living islam you know the values and behaviors that we portray that we can say a lot of things we can quote many things from our spiritual teachings from islam and from the quran and hadith but at the end of the end of the day if those statements don't match our behaviors, and that's irrespective of dealing with Muslims or non-Muslims. If, if, if our statements don't match our actions, then there's no benefit. So I try as much as I can that whatever I learn from those statements, from the Quran, from the Hadith, whatever I learn, I try to live it. Thank you very much. Jazakallah khair, Brother Harun Rashid Thank Khan, you. Secretary General of the MCV. Uh, uh, viewers who are watching this, please join us for the next one. Uh, we will have another guest to find out about their lives and their contribution inspired by their faith. So make sure you join us on Faith Inspired on the next program.